Well, good afternoon. I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this afternoon. My name is Frank Clegg and I'm the CEO of Canadians for Safe Technology. I've worked in the technology sector my whole career, including 14 years as the president of Microsoft Canada. For the past five years, I've volunteered with C4ST, working with all levels of government to create healthier communities across Canada. We do this by presenting to them the latest science about the health effects of microwave radiation from wireless devices. When I started in this business, almost no one outside the military was exposed to microwave radiation. Today, almost everyone is affected, and from the moment of conception onwards. I'm here to introduce you to an expert panel, including a doctor and scientists, who have a warning about the coming health conditions that are, that are predicted to rise if we blindly accept the next generation of 5G wireless technology. We are joining scientific researchers in 41 other countries, including the US and the UK, who are warning that 5G is going to pose a massive public health risk. It's not been made clear to the public that 5G won't just be another number and letter on your cell phone. It requires an entirely new infrastructure of thousands of small cellular antennas to be erected throughout cities where it's going to be installed. All of our speakers today have delivered expert testimony to the Parliamentary Health Committee in Ottawa on the subject of wireless radiation and human health. But so far, the only public discourse on 5G has, has, has been whether we should let a Chinese company install it or not. Today, we are here to change the conversation to the predictable and probable health risks that 5G wireless is likely to bring. I'll begin by introducing Dr. Rena Bray. Dr. Bray is trained as a chemical engineer and doctor of medicine with master's degrees in addiction, toxicology, and public health. She is associate professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine with a cross appointment to the Dalai Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. She is the medical director of the Provincial Environment Health Clinic at Women's College Hospital. Dr. Bray. Thank you. Over the past 15 years at our Provincial Environmental Health Clinic, we have been assessing an increasing number of vulnerable patients who have been referred from across Ontario, including but not limited to Toronto, Hamilton, London, Windsor, Ottawa, Sudbury, Thunder Bay, and Timmins. And those who suffer from the adverse effects brought on by electromagnetic exposures, most commonly to non-ionizing radio frequency radiation. These sources include cell phones, Wi-Fi, an increasing number of wireless radiation emitting consumer devices and cellular communication towers. More and more doctors are becoming aware of this condition as demonstrated by the rise in the number of referrals. The most prevalent symptoms include headache, fatigue, decreased ability to concentrate, tinnitus, irritability and insomnia. Impacts on the heart and the nervous system are also of great concern. Because of these symptoms, some people have, to, have been forced to quit their jobs or have had to take time off work or experienced reduced productivity. At the Environmental Health Clinic, we help them to identify the cause of their symptoms and educate them in order to minimize exposures and therefore recover, recover more readily. We see people from all walks of life, including teachers, students, government workers and business people. We are concerned that the upcoming introduction of 5G will significantly increase the proximity and extent of exposure to microwave radiation in Ontarians. We predict that the number of people who develop the symptoms I just mentioned will rise in the places where 5G is first installed. Tomorrow, on May 31st, Women's College Hospital in Toronto will host a full day symposium for healthcare professional providers across Ontario to discuss the science behind the health effects of wireless radiation and to show healthcare providers how to identify and manage the increasing number of people suffering from it. It is important to explain today what 5G means to people who aren't yet sensitive to microwave radiation or maybe aren't aware that they are sensitive. Many more people have symptoms that they don't know how to attribute to wireless radiation exposure. 
I'd like to introduce Magda Havis to explain the elevated risks associated with wireless 5G. Dr. Havis is a professor emeritus at Trent University. In the early days of her career, Dr. Havis informed all levels of government about acid rain before the politicians understood how dangerous it was. Her more recent work was linked to microwaves from cell phones and Wi-Fi to heart irregularities, in including tachycardia. Dr. Havis is internationally recognized for her research in this field. She has written almost 200 publications and has lectured at universities and medical conferences in 30 countries. Most recently, she has been researching the public health implications of 5G. Dr. Havis. Thank you very much, Frank. 5G, the fifth generation technology and the Internet of Things promises faster download speeds and the ability to have such conveniences as driverless cars and hosts of applications most of us haven't even dreamt of. The Toronto-Montreal corridor will be one of the early test sites in Canada and millions of people are going to be exposed to a new type of radiation called millimeter waves. These are an integral part of the 5G technology. This will bring with it an additional layer of microwave exposure. There will be thousands of new antennas installed. Small cell antennas could be placed as close as every third hydropole. And local planning authorities and people who live in these areas will have absolutely no say regarding their deployment. What the telecom industry has not mentioned in all of the advertising about 5G is that they, these are new frequencies that have been never tested for their long-term biological and health effects. Millimeter waves are currently being used in airport scanners and by the U.S. military as a form of crowd control. The name of that system is called the active denial system. At high intensities, these waves cause intense heat and pain since wet glands on the surface of our skin act like miniature antennas. At lower frequency, scientists are predicting damage to eyes, loss of insect populations which are already declining, antibiotic resistance in bacteria, and physiological effects on the nervous system and on the immune system. Living in a city like Toronto could become very difficult for a lot of people. When I was younger and researching acid rain, there was very little microwave uh, exposure except near airports and near radar installations because there is no natural generation of it on Earth and what comes from outer space is weak. Levels of microwave radiation today are trillions of times higher than they were even 50 years ago. 5G transmitters will radiate 24 hours a day and so close to homes it will be difficult if not impossible to avoid constant exposure. And this is in addition to what we are already exposed to with cell phones, tablets, Wi-Fi, video games, smart meters, and an increasing number of smart appliances in our homes. Deployment of 5G is particularly disturbing to those who have already developed sensitivity to electromagnetic pollution. In addition to the hundreds of patients being assessed at Dr. Bray's Environmental Health Clinic in Toronto, as many as one million people in Canada are believed to be sensitive, and this number is likely to increase with increasing exposure. The major symptoms include insomnia, chronic fatigue, chronic pain, mood disorders, poor short-term memory, difficulty concentrating, depression, heart palpitations that are interpreted as anxiety. Symptoms also include skin problems, dizziness, nose, nosebleeds, elevated blood sugar, and in extreme cases, loss of consciousness. Microwave frequencies are also shown in scientific studies to contribute to cancer and to damage sperm. Scientists and medical doctors across the United States and in the United Kingdom are requesting delayed deployment until testing can be conducted on the long-term biological effects of 5G technology. The scientific debate about the health effects of microwave radiation is over. Microwave radiation at levels to which we are currently exposed is adversely affecting human health. Of that, there is no doubt. The current debate is, can we afford the health costs that are likely to occur with the rollout of 5G? The federal government has failed to protect us from the rising levels of microwaves, and now they're downloading the financial fallout onto the provinces that pay for health costs. I would encourage provincial ministers to request at the very least that the federal government adopt a precautionary approach to 5G until we better understand the consequences of this technology. We need to know the true costs of 5G before we can assess its potential benefit.
Thank you, Dr. Havis. The list of symptoms that Dr. Havis and Dr. Bray described are all reported and documented. If you're wondering how this could have happened, it was predicted years ago by the cell phone companies themselves. On the C4ST website, you can find links to the warnings published by the manufacturers of the cell phones in all of your pockets right now. All of them advise you not to touch it while using it, and some specifically say not to carry it in a breast pocket or near the abdomen of a pregnant woman or a teenager. Unfortunately, those warnings are so small or buried inside the settings of your phone that most people never see them. We can't pretend that the convenience of having this technology is without cost, especially when the manufacturers of every cell phone are already admitting the danger in fine print. The wireless 5G world that Dr. Havis has just described, one with enough constant radiation to run a city full of driverless cars, can actually be considered trespassing and a theft of a right to a healthy life. When we wonder if something is harmful, we look to the authorities to determine that things are safe for us. In 2011, the World Health Organization, through the International Agency for Research on Cancer, classified radio frequency radiation that the blanket name for the type of signal employed by cell phones, cell towers, and Wi-Fi to be a class 2B possible carcinogen. That means there is enough firm and reliable scientific evidence to state that wireless radiation may give you cancer. One of the scientists involved in reviewing that classification was Anthony Miller, who is a professor emeritus at the University of Toronto. In the past, Dr. Miller has worked as a national health scientist for the Canadian government and has been awarded the Medal of Honor by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Dr. Miller is here today to bring you up to date on what scientists in his field are discovering about wireless radiation. Dr. Miller. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Frank. Uh, as Frank said, I was associated with the International Agency for Research on Cancer that recommended the world or the World Health Organization list all radio frequency radiation that is the radiation that powers cell phones and Wi-Fi including Wi-Fi as a possible carcinogen. The classification was officially designated as 2B. 2B is a list of possible carcinogens that also includes lead and DDT. That was back in 2011. This classification was based on the epidemiology and uh, other evidence that was available then. But since then, a lot has changed. New science has emerged, both human and animal. Human, by new analyses of some of the studies that were performed before, including the Canadian participation in what was called Interphone, new updated analyses of the studies in Sweden, Sweden being one of the first countries to introduce cell phones and therefore having people with the longest exposure and they have demonstrated that the longer exposure the greater the risk. But equally important there have been two very large animal carcinogenicity studies. Now we learnt more than 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I was involved in some of this in Canada, that we should not allow companies to introduce new chemicals without them first being tested for the possibility of carcinogenicity. There is every reason why such a requirement should be placed on companies that propose to introduce new radiation which will expose all of us. The two studies that have been conducted in the last f uh, 10 years, but reported only last years, were one by the National Toxicology Program in the United States, a very large animal study, and another by this prestigious Ramazzini Institute in Italy. And both of them showed that prolonged exposure to radio frequency radiation increases the risk of cancer. And indeed, they also showed that the cancers are similar to some of the cancers that are being observed in humans, and they showed that this sort of radiation increases 
the damage to our DNA. And if our DNA is damaged, then our risk of cancer increases substantially. Many scientists, including myself, now believe that the evidence is such that if IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, were to reevaluate radio frequency radiation, it would be placed in class one, i.e., a human carcinogen. And governments could not possibly ignore that. In fact, fortunately for us, the, an advisory committee of the International Agency for Research on Cancer has recommended that radio frequency radiation be re-evaluated with high priority. So we're hoping this will occur very shortly. In the meantime, we all must take care. We all must recognize that we are being exposed to radio frequency radiation. We must do our best through our MPPs, through our discussions with the municipality to prevent the introduction of 5G, which will only make matters worse. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. We're witnessing an unprecedented pace of change, the rise of wireless technology in our lives. We're also starting to witness a rise in a broad range of illnesses and conditions that could all be related to wireless technology. Prevent Cancer Now is a national organization that educates Canadians about reducing our exposure to the things we know can cause cancer. The group is made up of doctors and scientists and others who identify potential contributors to cancer, identify alternatives that may be safer, and work to improve decision making to achieve least toxic options. They have advised all levels of government across the country about these kinds of issues. The chair of Prevent Cancer Now, Meg Sears, is our next speaker. Dr. Sears holds a PhD in biochemical engineering. She is associated with the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. She has also been a scientific advisor to the Canadian Human Rights Commission, the National Research Council, and other government bodies. She's here today to speak about identifying a safer approach to communications technology. Dr. Sears. Thank you very much, Frank. So I'm a scientist, and some of my colleagues in the United States and around the world are describing 5G as a giant human experiment. I have to disagree. We have no evidence up front that this novel technology is safe. But think about it for a minute. If 5G rollout with millimeter wave radiation was indeed a modern scientific experiment, what would that look like? First, we would have a justifiable hypothesis. We would have reason to believe that there would be no adverse effect. All research requires ethical approval, informed consent from all participants. For an experiment, a portion of the population would have to be unexposed for control purposes. Where are we going to find that in 2019? We would certainly conduct what we call an interim analysis to halt the experiment at the very first sign that there was a problem. And finally, analyses and results would be reported publicly for discussion and implementation of logical next steps. None of this is happening. At the same time, Increases in use of personal wireless devices are concurrent with a rise in brain tumors that are associated with um, cell phones. This most aggressive type of brain tumor is increasing in young Americans and it has outpaced leukemia and testicular cancer. We're seeing changes, so this is accelerating. Male infertility is also on the rise while we learn that sperm and testes are harmed by cell phones in pockets and laptops on laps. Wireless radiation affects prenatal development in animals and in humans. Just as we are witnessing rapid increases in diagnoses of developmental disorders such as autism spectrum. 
Children are much more vulnerable, but we allow widespread use of Wi-Fi and wireless devices in their schools, even in junior kindergarten. Wireless radiation can affect basic biochemistry and affect many organs. But we don't have adequate data to make all of these connections scientifically. And without the data, science can't keep up with what's happening. The bottom line in Canada is that it takes decades for any new substance or technology to cause enough harm that it's finally proven dangerous and eventually is curtailed. It's so much wiser just to make less toxic, least toxic choices, to use less hazardous practices. And we can do that. Our recommendation is to invest in fiber optic cables, known technology, through communities within buildings across Canada. Fiber is already rolling out as a backbone of communications through Canadian centres, but it's not extending always to the fingers and the toes, and that's what we need. Communications via fibre is at least as rapid, it is secure, it's reliable, and it's harmless compared with, with the wireless radiation. What's more, signals through wire or fiber require much less energy. Powering 5G technology is projected to be a major contributor to greenhouse gases at a time when the national imperative is to reduce these gases to blunt climate chaos. We have enough evidence that this unprecedented technology has potential for unprecedented impacts on our health. 5G is not an ethical scientific experiment. But if it was an, our, an experiment, our hypothesis, our theory, would be that it would most likely cause significant stress on public and environmental health in Ontario. We definitely can communicate better and more safely with largely fiber-based technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sears. As you can see, this is a public health warning that we take very seriously. Ontario doctors are already counting the sick and injured from exposure to wireless devices. Despite all this current science, clinical observations and evidence, Public Health Ontario has not updated its approach to wireless radiation in nine years. This is the terrain on which 5G is coming. The public is getting sick and the government is not up to date with the science. I'm not aware of any attempt by my or related industries to establish the safety of upcoming or even current wireless products. They simply state that they meet federal safety guidelines, which I now understand are over 40 years out of date. I concur with Dr. Sears that we can do a lot better. There are scientists in 42 countries, including Canada, warning about 5G. The doctors and scientists here today are not alone. Some municipal jurisdictions in Belgium and Italy have placed a moratorium on 5G. This week, the global in insurance underwriter Swiss Re published its annual forecast and highlighted 5G as an upcoming insurable health concern globally in the next three years. This health crisis is avoidable because there are alternatives to wireless that are faster, more secure, more reliable, and much safer. Today we are recommending a four-step path to a safer future. Our first recommendation is that to the fullest extent possible, faster internet communication be built with fiber optic wiring into and throughout buildings. We also recommend that if wireless 5G is built in our neighborhoods, the appropriate government ministries commit to early detection of any health effects. This can be done by monitoring and reporting through public health agencies, giving a special consideration to children who are the most vulnerable. Our third recommendation is that the Ministry of Health begin discussions with doctors who are already assessing and th treating illnesses related to wireless exposure. Plans should be developed to educate family physicians across the province so they can identify the condition and help their patients. Our fourth and final recommendation is that the, the Ontario Ministry of Health 
and the Ontario Ministry of the Environment manage independent safety testing on wireless 5G before it is allowed to be installed in Toronto or anywhere else in the province. If Toronto is to be an early adopter of 5G, then Toronto will also be the location where illnesses first begin to rise. It would be fiscally responsible for the province to consider that all companies applying to install 5G infrastructure also be obliged to pay for any measurable increase in the cost of health care in Ontario, especially if they first can't guarantee its safety. Since the province has to pay for health care, it has a right to demand this technology be properly tested for safety. It also has an obligation to protect people anywhere in Ontario. Today we are joining the hundreds of scientists and doctors from dozens of countries who say there, enough, there is enough evidence to predict a rise in illness and a rise in health care costs. If we allow 5G to be rolled out without question. A copy of today's proceedings, along with scientific citations, is being sent to the Office of the Premier, the Minister of Health, Finance and Environment. Finally, in anticipation of the medical symposium tomorrow at Women's College Hospital, some of their patients who have attended today to provide a window into how they live with the effects of microwave radiation. These individuals are the proverbial canaries in the coal mine the more sensitive among us whose symptoms emerged during the first round of cell towers and Wi-Fi. David Fancy is a professor in the Department of Drama at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario. Melissa Chalmers is a commercial airline pilot who has been off work for several years after being injured by microwave radiation from t cell towers behind her home. They have come here today in case anyone wants to speak directly to someone who is living with the long-term effects of electromagnetic injury. They and others who suffer from the effects of wireless radiation will also be at the symposium tomorrow and members of the medium are very welcome to attend. It is at Women's College Hospital just across the street at 76 Granville. It begins at 8 a.m. and runs for the day. For the benefit of medical practitioners, the event will be live streamed via the OTN the Ontario Telemedicine Network at otn.ca so they can learn more about how to identify EMF susceptible individuals and manage their care properly. I thank the doctors and scientists who came to speak to all of us today and I thank you for coming and listening. If you have any questions please then direct them through me to the speakers. Thank you. Melanie Glantz from CBC. Is Women's College actually involved with the symposium? Are they putting it on or you're renting the space at no. Women's College? They're supporting our, our symposium. They're not putting it on. The Environmental Health Clinic is putting it on and they're supporting our initiative. And they're supporting your being here today? Yes. Or? Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you agree with everything that you heard here today as far yes, as what the research mm -hmm. says? Yes. Okay. And so what exactly is it that you want the province to do or the government to do regarding well, 5G? Well, I think there needs to be a moratorium and uh, I think that there needs to be um, uh, a space for dialogue, uh, a time to get scientists and doctors together and government officials together, policymakers, to discuss uh, next steps and, and to move ahead prudently rather than just roll this out without any thought about the implications. Uh, and health impacts on uh, on our public. And are you um, talking about cancer risk and other associated risk? Because I haven't seen the actual. I was. You've done this your whole life. I just started researching this today. I haven't seen anything beyond animal studies, and I know we don't even report on animal studies. So. Well, I should be discussing this uh, tomorrow at the symposium, uh, the human studies and the animal studies, so that. I thought I just said that <laughs> earlier. <laughs> I mean, can you send me those studies that you're going to be talking about? The um, what you'll see at the at the back um, is uh, of these is is the list of the citations um, that uh, I've quoted in my talk. So on page ten, get through to page eleven. Yeah, compare. 4G and the 5G, and uh, 
how worse the situation could be? Can you give some specific? If we if we compare 4G and 5G, um, one of the differences with 5G is that they're going to be using higher frequencies. Um, they're going to be using frequencies that are above six um, gigahertz right now. That's roughly the highest we're going in our telecom communication. And because they're higher frequencies, you'll be able to load a lot more data onto the, the wave, so it'll be a faster download speed. They're also going to be using lower frequencies, the frequencies that were currently being used. So it's not entirely millimeter waves. They're going to be using 600 megahertz and other frequencies. So basically, when 5G comes on board, they're going to have a number of what they call small cells placed on hydro poles or lamp posts. And because the radiation doesn't travel very far, you're going to have to have a lot of them. So probably every fourth or fifth or sixth house, depending on how close together they are, will have one of these miniature antennas. So basically, the entire city is going to be blanketed by this additional higher frequency, the millimeter wave, as well as the lower frequencies that we're exposed to now. So the levels of radiation to which we will be exposed will go up that much higher. When it comes to millimeter radiation, there are absolutely no studies that I'm aware of, and, and certainly I've talked to a lot of my colleagues around the world. We don't know what constant exposure to low levels of millimeter waves, how that's going to affect the hum human body. We simply don't know. What little evidence we have uh, for short-term studies is that it's, it's going to be harmful, not only to human populations, but also to animal populations, particularly insects, because the size of the wave is about the same size as an insect. And so when you have something that's similar in size, there's a resonance that happens and there's more energy absorbed. And the same thing goes for our eyes. Our eyes are extremely sensitive to this radiation. And so doctors are predicting that there's going to be an increase in problems with, various problems with eyesight. If we don't know, is it fair to sit here then and scare scare people that are potentially watching this about what the impacts are, be, are going to be if you actually just said, we don't really know? Um, I don't think we're scaring people. I think we're trying to educate them and inform them and ultimately empower them. Right now, 5G is being rolled out without anyone having any say in it. Mm -hmm. City councils uh, can't tell you, you know, we don't want it in our city or we don't want it in this location. So we've all lost our voice to speak out about this. And the reason scientists and medical doctors are speaking out is because they're already dealing with the carnage that has happened to the point of 3G and 4G and 2G prior to that. We know this, you, you mentioned how you're relatively new to this. The amount of research on cancers, both in humans and in animal studies, is really exceptional, um, the amount that's out there. We know that it causes gliomas, which is a form of brain tumor. It contributes to meningiomas, which is the lining of the brain. It causes salivary gland tumors. Because, you know, these are all things where you hold your cell phone. Women who put their cell phone in their bra have breast cancer immediately under the phone if they've done it for, you know, 10 years plus. So the fact that this radiation causes cancer is really no longer a debate. As Dr. Miller said, um, it's not a debate among the scientists who are doing research in this area. Not according to the NIH website, which I was just on, looking at all the studies that they attached to it. There well, nothing ever since the two animal studies that Dr. Miller mentioned, um, the whole game has changed. That's what was missing from the International Agency for Research on Cancer back in 2011. Uh, they didn't have really good animal studies. They only had one very large animal study. Now there are three of them, and they're all showing the same thing. So we can continue to, to hide, you know, bury our head in this, in the sand, and say, okay, we don't know what the consequences are. Let's roll it out and find out. And we're not going to be happy with those results. So I think the warnings that we're trying to provide, we're trying to wake up the population, not frighten them wake them up and empower them. Uh, so far, how's the uh, respond from a federal level? Sorry, say that again? So far, how does it respond from a, a federal agencies, federal level? Because the, for, for the, all the regulations and because the 5G will be across the country and uh, all over the world. So with the upcoming federal elections, so uh, did you approach uh, different uh, parties to raise this issue? We have worked for the last five years at the, at the federal level 
met with over 50 MPs, have requested to meet with all di four different ministers of health, uh, have met with three of the director generals that have been in their job over the last five years, and nobody is, wants to talk about this. Uh, they're just ingrained in the current uh, science, or sorry, not the current science, they're ingrained in science from 2006 or 2007. Uh, they brought out an update in 2015 based on 2013 science, and they just will not, will not uh, even take any meetings to, to allow us to debate. We've invited them to sessions, we've offered to have experts like you're seeing today from Canada and around the world to present. Uh, I mentioned the Parliamentary Health Committee. We were successful in getting that federal committee uh, to spend three of their sessions on uh, microwave radiation. They came out with a report and the minister just basically said thanks but that's, uh, we're comfortable with everything you are. So we've, we've tried. Uh, we will continue to advocate and we will continue to educate. But it's, it's, it, we have not been successful today, day, yet, in finding a champion at the federal level. I'm sad to say that, but it's the truth of the matter. So we are, for whatever reason, Health Canada is stuck in the science from the 1960s and 70s and not accepting any of the current technology and science that's peer-reviewed, thousands of peer-reviewed published research that shows harm well below the federal guideline levels. And what's your message for general public? Because this information is not being well known. Like public has no idea actually. So uh, for the uh, educate general public, at least give them some information. What's your suggestions? We, we have put together a, a set of safety tips uh, that's on our website, c4st.org. And basically the message is, really two things. First of all, distance is your friend. So keep the technology as far away as you possibly can. So never hold it against your head. Don't put it against your body. Second thing is when you are using a wireless device of any sort, minimize the time that you're using it. So if you're going to watch a movie, download the movie, put the device in airplane mode and watch it. So, and then when you're sleeping at night, turn off all the technology in your house. Put your Wi-Fi router on a timer so that when you're sleeping, your body is in a state of rest and repair so that you can, because you are bombarded, we are bombarded everywhere we go. So, you know, so while you're at least sleeping, have every family member be in a state of, 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 of repair and rest you know, by turning off all the Wi-Fi, uh, turning the cell phone, get it out of the bedroom. Um, Dr. Bray, I know you've got other yeah, recommendations too for patients. This kind of information needs to be made uh, available to all the children in the schools, mm -hmm to um, the students at universities. Um, uh, we have to teach them to practice what we preach and, um, and we have to be change the infrastructure of the way institutions are run um, with regards to wireless technology. And it, it's not hard to fix the problem. It's just a matter of becoming more savvy and knowledgeable about the, the, the impacts and how to reduce exposures. This is not this is not rocket science. This is called wiring, fiber optics. <laughs> it's really not rocket science. So compared with the United States, uh, do they pay more attention of the health risk compared with Canada? No, the, at, at the federal level, the the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, has taken the same stance uh, that Health Canada has taken. We are seeing pockets of school districts in the U.S. that are. Um, really limiting the Wi-Fi uh, in schools. We are seeing some counties that have taken some initiatives to, to prevent the slowdown of 5G. As I mentioned, some pro uh, counties in, in Europe are doing that. But at the national level, there are, other than France, it's probably the most aggressive in terms of reducing Wi-Fi in schools. And, and Belgium um, restricts the marketing of cell phones to children. Uh, Taiwan, it's illegal to give a, a, a two-year-old child a um, uh, a, a tablet or a cell phone. So there are some countries that are doing some things, but to answer your question specifically, the U.S. and Canada, unfortunately, are pretty aligned on this issue. But you know, Canada has taken steps. The like province of Ontario, the province of Quebec, have taken things like pesticides, where we've gone out ahead of the federal government. We've gone out ahead of the U.S. And so we're seeing there's an opportunity now, especially as an Ontario taxpayer, we are paying the brunt. We will pay the brunt of the all increasing health effects. So we, we think there's an opportunity for Ontario to step forward and say, look, there's a fiscal opportunity here, plus there's a tremendous opportunity to improve Ontarians' health going forward. Okay. 
All right. So thank you for your time, and thank you again for taking your time out of your schedules to join us. Thank you. Thank you.